This is section twenty of Mark Twain, a biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, a biography by Albert Bigelow Payne. Volume one, part one, eighteen thirty five to eighteen sixty six. Chapter twenty, Keokuk Days. Read by John Greenman. Orion wished his brother to remain with him in the Muscatine office, but the young man declared he must go to St. Louis and earn some money before he would be able to afford that luxury. He returned to his place on the St. Louis Evening News, where he remained until late winter or early spring of the following year. He lived at this time with the Pavey family, probably one of the Hannibal Paveys, rooming with a youth named Frank E. Burrow, a journeyman chairmaker with a taste for Dickens, Thackeray, Scott, and Disraeli. Burrow had really a fine literary appreciation for his years, and the boys were comrades and close friends. Twenty-two years later Mark Twain exchanged with Burrow some impressions of himself at that earlier time. Clemens wrote, "'My dear Burrow, as you describe me, I can picture myself as I was twenty-two years ago. The portrait is correct. You think I have grown some. <laughs> upon my word there was room for it you have described a callow fool a self-sufficient ass a mere human tumble-bug stern in air heaving at his bit of dung imagining that he is remodeling the world and is entirely capable of doing it right that is what I was at nineteen to twenty. Orion Clemens, in the meantime, had married and removed to Keokuk. He had married during a visit to that city, in the casual, impulsive way so characteristic of him, and the fact that he had acquired a wife in the operation seemed at first to have escaped his inner consciousness. He tells it himself. He says, at sunrise on the next morning after the wedding we left in a stage for muscatine we halted for dinner at burlington after dispatching that meal we stood on the pavement when the stage drove up ready for departure i climbed in gathered the buffalo robe around me and leaned back unconscious that i had anything further to do a gentleman standing on the pavement said to my wife miss do you go by this stage I said, oh, I forgot, and sprang out and helped her in. A wife was a new kind of possession to which I had not yet become accustomed. I had forgotten her. Orion's wife had been Mary Stotts, her mother a friend of Jane Clemens' girlhood. She proved a faithful helpmate to Orion, but in those early days of marriage she may have found life with him rather trying, and it was her homesickness that brought them to Keokuk. Brother Sam came up from St. Louis, by and by, to visit them, and Orion offered him five dollars a week and board to remain. He accepted. The office at this time, or soon after, was located on the third floor of 52 Main Street, in the building at present occupied by the Patterson Shoe Company. Henry Clemens, now seventeen, was also in Orion's employ, and a lad by the name of Dick Hingham. Henry and Sam slept in the office, and Dick came in for social evenings. Also a young man named Edward Brownell, who clerked in the bookstore on the ground floor. These were likely to be lively evenings. A music dealer and teacher, Professor Isbell, occupied the floor just below, and did not care for their diversions. He objected, but hardly in the right way. Had he gone to Samuel Clemens gently, he undoubtedly would have found him willing to make any concessions. Instead, he assailed him roughly, and the next evening the boys set up a lot of empty wine bottles, which they had found in a barrel in a closet, and with stones for balls played ten pins on the office floor. This was Dick and Sam. Henry declined to join the game. Isbel rushed upstairs and battered on the door, but they paid no attention. Next morning he waited for the young men and denounced them wildly. They merely ignored him, and that night organized a military company, 
made up of themselves and a new German apprentice boy, and drilled up and down over the singing class. Dick Hingham led these military maneuvers. He was a girlish sort of a fellow, but he had a natural taste for soldiering. The others used to laugh at him. They called him a disguised girl, and declared he would run if a gun were really pointed in his direction. They were mistaken. Seven years later, Dick died at Fort Donelson with a bullet in his forehead. This, by the way. Isbell now adopted new tactics. He came up very pleasantly and said, I like your military practice better than your ten-pin exercise, but on the whole it seems to disturb the young ladies. You see how it is yourself. You couldn't possibly teach music with a company of raw recruits drilling overhead now, could you? Won't you please stop it? It bothers my pupils. Sam Clemens regarded him with mild surprise. Does it? he said very deliberately. Why, didn't you mention it before? To be sure we don't want to disturb the young ladies. They gave up the horseplay, and not only stopped the disturbance, but joined one of the singing classes. Samuel Clemens had a pretty good voice in those days, and could drum fairly well on the piano and guitar. He did not become a brilliant musician, but he was easily the most popular member of the singing class. They liked his frank nature, his jokes, and his humor, his slow, quaint fashion of speech. The young ladies called him openly and fondly a fool, a term of endearment, as they applied it meaning only that he kept them in a more or less constant state of wonder and merriment, and indeed it would have been hard for them to say whether he was really light-minded and frivolous, or the wisest of them all. He was twenty now, and at the age for love-making, yet he remained, as in Hannibal, a beau rather than a suitor, good friend and comrade to all, wooer of none. Ella Creel, a cousin on the Lampton side, a great belle. Also Ella Patterson, related through Orion's wife and generally known as Ick, and Belle Stotts were perhaps his favorite companions, but there were many more. He was always ready to stop and be merry with them, full of his pranks and pleasantries, though they noticed that he quite often carried a book under his arm, a history or a volume of Dickens, or the tales of Edgar Allan Poe. He read at odd moments, at night voluminously, until very late sometimes. Already, in that early day, it was his habit to smoke in bed, and he had made him an oriental pipe of the hubble-bubble variety, because it would hold more and was more comfortable than the regular short pipe of daytime use. But it had its disadvantages. Sometimes it would go out, and that would mean sitting up and reaching for a match and leaning over to light the bowl which stood on the floor. Young Brownell from below was passing upstairs to his room on the fourth floor one night when he heard Sam Clemens call. The two were great chums by this time, and Brownell poked his head in at the door. "'What will you have, Sam?' he asked. "'Come in, Ed. Henry's asleep, and I am in tr trouble. I want somebody to light my pipe.' "'Why don't you get up and light it yourself?' Brownell asked. "'I would, only I knew you'd be along in a few minutes, and would do it for me. Brownell scratched the necessary match, stooped down, and applied it. What are you reading, Sam? he asked. Oh, nothing much. A so-called funny book. One of these days I'll write a funnier book than that myself. Brownell laughed. No, you won't, Sam, he said. You are too lazy ever to write a book. A good many years later, when the name Mark Twain had begun to stand for American humor, the owner of it gave his Sandwich Island lecture in Keokuk. Speaking of the unreliability of the islanders, he said, The king is, I believe, one of the greatest liars on the face of the earth, except one, and I am very sorry to locate that one right here in the city of Keokuk, in 
the person of Ed Brownell. The Keokuk episode in Mark Twain's life was neither very long nor very actively important. It extended over a period of less than two years, two vital years, no doubt, if all the bearings could be known, but they were not years of startling occurrence. Yet he made at least one beginning there. At a printer's banquet he delivered his first after-dinner speech, a hilarious speech, its humor of a primitive kind. Whatever its shortcomings, it delighted his audience and raised him many points in the public regard. He had entered a field of entertainment in which he would one day have no rival. They impressed him into a debating society after that, and there was generally a stir of attention when Sam Clemens was about to take the floor. Orion Clemens records how his brother undertook to teach the German apprentice music. There was an old guitar in the office, and Sam taught Fritz a song beginning, Grasshopper sitting on a sweet potato vine, Turkey came along and yanked him from behind. The main point in the lesson was in giving the word yanked, the proper expression and emphasis, accompanied by a sweep of the fingers across the strings. With serious face and deep earnestness, Fritz in his broken English would attempt these lines, while his teacher would bend over and hold his sides with laughter at each ridiculous effort. Without intending it, Fritz had his revenge. One day his tormentor's hand was caught in the press when the German boy was turning the wheel. Sam called to him to stop, but the boy's mind was slow to grasp the situation. The hand was badly wounded, though no bones were broken. In due time it recovered its power and dexterity, but the trace of the scars remained. Orion's printing office was not a prosperous one. He had not the gift of prosperity in any form. When he found it difficult to pay his brother's wages, he took him into partnership, which meant that Sam got no wages at all, barely a living, for the office could not keep its head above water. The junior partner was not disturbed, however. He cared little for money in those days, beyond his actual needs, and these were modest enough. His mother, now with Pamela, was amply provided for. Orion himself tells how his business dwindled away. He printed a Keokuk directory, but it did not pay largely. He was always too eager for the work, too low in his bid for it. Samuel Clemens in this directory is set down as an antiquarian, a joke, of course, though the point of it is now lost. Only two of his Keokuk letters have been preserved. The first indicates the general disorder of the office and a growing dissatisfaction. It is addressed to his mother and sister, and bears date of June 10, 1856. I don't like to work at too many things at once. They take Henry and Dick away from me, too. Before we commenced the directory, Orion printed two editions of the directory. This was probably the second one. I could tell before breakfast just how much work could be done during the day and manage accordingly, but now they throw all my plans into disorder by taking my hands away from their work. I am not getting along well with the job work. I can't work blindly without system. I gave Dick a job yesterday, which I calculated he could set in two hours, and I could work off on the press in three, and therefore just finish it by supper time. But he was transferred to the directory, and the job promised this morning remains untouched. Through all the great pressure of job work lately, I never before failed in a promise of the kind. The other letter is dated two months later, August 5th. It was written to Henry, who was visiting in St. Louis or Hannibal at the time, and introduces the first mention of the South American fever, which now possessed the writer. Lynch and Herndon had completed their survey of the upper Amazon, and Lieutenant Herndon's account of the exploration was being widely read. 
Poring over the book nights, young Clemens had been seized with the desire to go to the headwaters of the South American River, there to collect coca and make a fortune. All his life he was subject to such impulses as that, and ways and means were not always considered. It did not occur to him that it would be difficult to get to the Amazon, and still more difficult to ascend the river. It was his nature to see results with a dazzling largeness that blinded him to the detail of their achievement. In the Turning Point article already mentioned, he refers to this. He says, That was more than fifty years ago. In all that time my temperament has not changed by even a shade. I have been punished many and many a time, and bitterly, for doing things and reflecting afterward, but these tortures have been of no value to me. I still do the thing commanded by circumstance and temperament, and reflect afterward, always violently. When I am reflecting on these occasions, even deaf persons can hear me think. In the letter to Henry we see that his resolve was already made, his plans matured, also that Orion had not as yet been taken into full confidence. Ma knows my determination, but even she counsels me to keep it from Orion. She says I can treat him as I did her when I started to St. Louis and went to New York. I can start for New York and go to South America. He adds that Orion had promised him fifty or one hundred dollars, but that he does not depend upon it, and will make other arrangements. He fears obstacles may be put in his way, and he will bring various influences to bear. I shall take care that Ma and Orion are plentifully supplied with South American books. They have Herndon's report now. Ward and the doctor and myself will hold a grand consultation tonight at the office. We have agreed that no more shall be admitted into our company. He had enlisted those two adventurers in his enterprise, a Dr. Martin and the young man Ward. They were very much in earnest, but the start was not made as planned, most likely for want of means. Young Clemens, however, did not give up the idea. He made up his mind to work in the direction of his desire, following his trade and laying by money for the venture. But fate, or providence, or accident, or whatever we may choose to call the unaccountable, stepped in just then and laid before him the means of turning another sharp corner in his career. One of those things happened which we refuse to accept in fiction as possible, but fact has a smaller regard for the credibilities. As in the case of the Joan of Arc episode, and this adds to its marvel, it was the wind that brought the talismanic gift. It was a day in early November, bleak, bitter, and gusty, with curling snow. Most persons were indoors. Samuel Clemens, going down Main Street, saw a flying bit of paper pass him and lodge against the side of a building. Something about it attracted him, and he captured it. It was a fifty-dollar bill. He had never seen one before, but he recognized it. He thought he must be having a pleasant dream. The temptation came to pocket his good fortune and say nothing. His need of money was urgent, but he had also an urgent and troublesome conscience. In the end he advertised his find. I didn't describe it very particularly, and I waited in daily fear that the owner would turn up and take away my fortune. By and by I couldn't stand it any longer. My conscience had gotten all that was coming to it. I felt that I must take that money out of danger. In the Turning Point article he says, 
I advertised the find and left for the Amazon the same day, a statement which we may accept with a literary discount. As a matter of fact, he remained ample time, and nobody ever came for the money. It may have been swept out of a bank or caught up by the wind from some counting-room table. It may have materialized out of the unseen. Who knows? At all events, it carried him the first stage of a journey, the end of which he little dreamed. End of chapter 20, Keokuk Days, read by John Greenman. This is section 21 of Mark Twain, A Biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography by Albert Bigelow Payne. Volume 1, Part 1, 1835 to 1866. Chapter 21 Scotchman named McFarlane. He concluded to go to Cincinnati, which would be on the way either to New York or New Orleans. He expected to sail from one of these points, but first paid a brief visit to his mother in St. Louis, for he had a far journey and a long absence in view. Jane Clemens made him renew his promise as to cards and liquor, and gave him her blessing. He had expected to go from St. Louis to Cincinnati, but a new idea, a literary idea, came to him, and he returned to Keokuk. The Saturday Post, a Keokuk weekly, was a prosperous sheet giving itself certain literary airs. He was in favor with the management, of which George Reese was the head, and it had occurred to him that he could send letters of his travels to the Post, for a consideration. He may have had a still larger ambition, at least the possibility of a book seems to have been in his consciousness. Reese agreed to take letters from him at five dollars each good payment for that time and place. The young traveler, jubilant in the prospect of receiving money for literature, now made another start, this time by way of Quincy, Chicago, and Indianapolis, according to his first letter in the Post, supplied by Thomas Reese of the Springfield, Illinois Register, son of George Reese named. This letter is dated Cincinnati, November 14, 1856, and it is not a promising literary production. It was written in the exaggerated dialect then regarded as humorous, and while here and there are flashes of the undoubted Mark Twain type, they are few and far between. The genius that a little more than ten years later would delight the world flickered feebly enough at twenty-one. The letter is a burlesque account of the trip to Cincinnati. A brief extract from it, as characteristic as any, will serve. I went down one night to the railroad office there, pretty close on to the McLeod house, and bought about a choir a yaller paper, cut up into tickets, one for each railroad in the United States, I thought, but I found out afterwards that the Alexandria and Boston airline was left out, and then got a baggage feller to take my trunk down to the boat, where he spilled it out on the levee, busting it open and shaking out the contents, consisting of guides to Chicago and guides to Cincinnati and traveler's guides and all kinds of sich books, not excepting a guide to heaven, which last ain't much use to a feller in Chicago, I can tell you. Finally, that fast packet quit ringing her bell and started down the river, but she hadn't gone more'n mile till she ran clean up on top of a sandbar, where she stuck till plumb one o'clock, spite of captain swearin', and they had to set the whole crew to cussin' at last afore they'd got her off. This is humor we may concede of that early American type which a little later would have its flower in Nasby and Artemis Ward. Only careful examination reveals in it a hint of the later Mark Twain. The letters were signed Snodgrass, and there are but two of them. The second, dated exactly four months after the first, is in the same assassinating dialect, 
and recounts among other things the scarcity of coal in cincinnati and an absurd adventure in which snodgrass has a baby left on his hands from the fewness of the letters we may assume that snodgrass found them hard work and it is said he raised on the price at all events the second concluded the series they are mainly important in that they are the first of his contributions that have been preserved also the first for which he received a cash return he secured work at his trade in cincinnati at the printing office of wrightson and company and remained there until april eighteen fifty seven that winter in cincinnati was eventless enough but it was marked by one notable association one that beyond doubt forwarded samuel clemens general interest in books influenced his taste and inspired in him certain views and philosophies which he never forgot he lodged at a cheap boarding-house filled with the usual commonplace people with one exception this exception was a long lank unsmiling scotchman named mcfarlane who was twice as old as clemens and wholly unlike him without humor or any comprehension of it yet meeting on the common plane of intellect the two became friends clemens spent his evenings in mcfarlane's room until the clock struck ten then mcfarlane grilled a herring just as the englishman sumner in philadelphia had done two years before and the evening ended mcfarlane had books serious books histories philosophies and scientific works also a bible and a dictionary he had studied these and knew them by heart he was a direct and diligent talker he never talked of himself and beyond the statement that he had acquired his knowledge from reading and not at school his personality was a mystery he left the house at six in the morning and returned at the same hour in the evening his hands were hardened from some sort of toil mechanical labor his companion thought but he never knew he would have liked to know and he watched for some reference to slip out that would betray mcfarlane's trade but this never happened what he did learn was that mcfarlane was a veritable storehouse of abstruse knowledge a living dictionary and a thinker and philosopher besides he had at least one vanity the claim that he knew every word in the english dictionary and he made it good the younger man tried repeatedly to discover a word that mcfarlane could not define perhaps mcfarlane was vain of his other mental attainments for he never tried of discoursing upon deep and grave matters and his companion never tired of listening this scotch philosopher did not always reflect the conclusions of others he had speculated deeply and strikingly on his own account that was a good while before darwin and wallace gave out their conclusions on the descent of man yet mcfarlane was already advancing a similar philosophy he went even further life he said had been developed in the course of ages from a few microscopic seed germs from one perhaps planted by the creator in the dawn of time and that from this beginning development on an ascending scale had finally produced man mcfarlane said that the scheme had stopped there and failed that man had retrograded that man's heart was the only bad one in the animal kingdom that man was the only animal capable of malice vindictiveness drunkenness almost the only man that could endure personal uncleanliness he said that man's intellect was a depraving addition to him which in the end placed him in a rank far below the other beasts though it enabled him to keep them in servitude and captivity along with many members of his own race they were long fermenting discourses that young samuel clemens listened to that winter in mcfarlane's room and those who knew the real mark twain and his philosophies will recognize that those evenings left their impress upon him for life End of chapter 21 Scotchman Named McFarlane Read by John Greenman This is section 22 of Mark Twain, A Biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography 
by Albert Bigelow Payne. Volume One, Part One, 1835 to 1866. Chapter Twenty Two, The Old Call of the River. When spring came, with budding life and quickening impulses, when the trees in the parks began to show a hint of green, the Amazonian idea developed afresh, and the would-be cocoa hunter prepared for his expedition. He had saved a little money, enough to take him to New Orleans, and he decided to begin his long trip with a peaceful journey down the Mississippi, for once at least, to give himself up to that indolent luxury of the majestic stream that had been so large a part of his early dreams. The Ohio River steamers were not the most sumptuous craft afloat, but they were slow and hospitable. The winter had been bleak and hard. Spring fever and a large love of indolence had combined in that drowsy condition which makes one willing to take his time. Mark Twain tells us in Life on the Mississippi that he ran away vowing to never return until he could come home a pilot shedding glory this is a literary statement the pilot ambition had never entirely died but it was coca and the amazon that were uppermost in his head when he engaged passage on the paul jones for new orleans and so conferred immortality on that ancient little craft he bade good-bye to mcfarland put his traps aboard the bell rang the whistle blew the gangplank was hauled in, and he had set out on a voyage that was to continue not for a week or a fortnight, but for four years, four marvelous sunlit years, the glory of which would color all that followed them. In the Mississippi book the author conveys the impression of being then a boy of perhaps seventeen. Writing from that standpoint he records incidents that were more or less inventions, or that happened to others. He was, in reality, considerably more than twenty-one years old, for it was April 1857 that he went aboard the Paul Jones, and he was fairly familiar with steamboats and the general requirements of piloting. He had been brought up in a town that turned out pilots. He had heard the talk of their trade. One, at least, of the Bowen boys was already on the river, while Sam Clemens was still a boy in Hannibal and had often been home to air his grandeur and dilate on the marvel of his work. That learning the river was no light task Sam Clemens very well knew. Nevertheless, as the little boat made its drowsy way down the river into lands that grew ever pleasanter with advancing spring, the old permanent ambition of boyhood stirred again, and the call of the faraway Amazon, with its coca, and its variegated zoology, grew faint. Horace Bixby, pilot of the Paul Jones, then a man of thirty-two, still living, 1910, and at the wheel, the writer of this memoir interviewed Mr. Bixby personally and has followed his phrasing throughout, was looking out over the bow at the head of island number thirty-five when he heard a slow, pleasant voice say, "'Good morning.' Bixby was a clean-cut, direct, courteous man. "'Good morning, sir,' he said briskly, without looking around. As a rule, Mr. Bixby did not care for visitors in the pilot-house. This one presently came up and stood a little behind him. "'How would you like a young man to learn the river?' he said. The pilot glanced over his shoulder and saw a rather slender, loose-limbed young fellow with a fair, girlish complexion and a great tangle of auburn hair. "'I wouldn't like it. Cub pilots are more trouble than they're worth, a great deal more trouble than profit.' The applicant was not discouraged. "'I am a printer by trade,' he went on in his easy, deliberate way. "'It doesn't agree with me.' I thought I'd go to South America. Bixby kept his eye on the river, but a note of interest crept into his voice. What makes you pull your words that way? Pulling being the river term for drawling, he asked. The young man had taken a seat on the visitor's bench. You'll have to ask my mother, he said more slowly than ever. She pulls hers, too. Pilot Bixby woke up and laughed. He had a keen sense of humor, and the manner of the reply amused him. 
his guest made another advance do you know the bowen boys he asked pilots in the st louis and new orleans trade i know them well all three of them william bowen did his first steering for me a mighty good boy too had a testament in his pocket when he came aboard in a week's time he had swapped it for a pack of cards i know sam too and bart old schoolmates of mine in hannibal sam and will especially were my chums come over and stand by the side of me he said what is your name the applicant told him and the two stood looking at the sunlit water do you drink no do you gamble no sir do you swear not for amusement only under pressure do you chew no sir never but i must smoke did you ever do any steering was bixby's next question i have steered everything on the river but a steamboat i guess very well take the wheel and see what you can do with a steamboat keep her as she is toward that lower cottonwood snag bixby had a sore foot and was glad of a little relief he sat down on the bench and kept a careful eye on the course by and by he said there is just one way that i would take a young man to learn the river that is for money what do you charge five hundred dollars and i to be at no expense whatever in those days pilots were allowed to carry a learner or cub board free mr bixby meant that he was to be at no expense in port or for incidentals his terms looked rather discouraging i haven't got five hundred dollars in money sam said i've got a lot of tennessee land worth twenty-five cents an acre i'll give you two thousand acres of that bixby dissented no nope. I don't want any unimproved real estate. I have too much already. Sam reflected upon the amount he could probably borrow from Pamela's husband without straining his credit. Well, then, I'll give you one hundred dollars cash and the rest when I earn it. Something about this young man had won Horace Bixby's heart. His slow, pleasant speech, his unhurried quiet manner with the wheel his evident sincerity of purpose these were externals but beneath them the pilot felt something of that quality of mind or heart which later made the world love mark twain the terms proposed were agreed upon the deferred payments were to begin when the pupil had learned the river and was receiving pilot's wages during mr bixby's daylight watches his pupil was often at the wheel that trip while the pilot sat directing him and nursing his sore foot any literary ambitions samuel clemens may have had grew dim by the time they had reached new orleans he had almost forgotten he had been a printer and when he learned that no ship would be sailing to the amazon for an indefinite period the feeling grew that a directing hand had taken charge of his affairs from new orleans his chief did not return to cincinnati but went to st louis taking with him his new cub who thought it fine indeed to come steaming up to that great city with its thronging waterfront its levee fairly packed with trucks drays and piles of freight the whole flanked with a solid mile of steamboats lying side by side bow a little upstream their belching stacks reared high against the blue a towering front of trade it was glorious to nose one's way to a place in that stately line to become a unit however small of that imposing fleet at st louis sam borrowed from mr moffat the funds necessary to make up his first payment and so concluded his contract then when he suddenly found himself on a fine big boat in a pilot house so far above the water that he seemed perched on a mountain a sumptuous temple his happiness seemed complete. End of chapter 22 The Old Call of the River Read by John Greenman
This is section 23 of Mark Twain, A Biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography by Albert Bigelow Payne. Volume 1, Part 1, 1835 to 1866. Chapter 23 The Supreme Science. In his Mississippi book, Mark Twain has given us a marvelous exposition of the science of river piloting and of the colossal task of acquiring and keeping a knowledge requisite for that work. He has not exaggerated this part of the story of developments in any detail. He has set down a simple confession. Serenely enough, he undertook the task of learning twelve hundred miles of the great changing, shifting river as exactly and as surely by daylight or darkness as one knows the way to his own features. As already suggested, he had at least an inkling of what that undertaking meant. His statement that he supposed all that a pilot had to do was to keep his boat in the river is not to be accepted literally. Still, he could hardly have realized the full majesty of his task. Nobody could do that, not until afterward. Horace Bixby was a lightning pilot with a method of instruction as direct and forcible as it was effective. He was a small man, hot and quick-firing, though kindly too, and gentle when he had blown off. After one rather pyrotechnic misunderstanding as to the manner of imparting and acquiring information, he said, "'My boy, you must get a little memorandum book, and every time I tell you a thing, put it down right away.' there's only one way to be a pilot, and that is to get this entire river by heart. You have to know it, just like ABC. So Sam Clemens got the little book, and presently it fairly bristled with the names of towns, points, bars, islands, bends, and reaches, but it made his heart ache to think that he had only half of the river set down, for, as the watches were four hours off and four hours on, there were long gaps during which he had slept. The little notebook still exists, thin and faded, with black waterproof covers, its neat tiny penciled notes still telling the story of that first trip. Most of them are cryptographic abbreviations, not readily deciphered now. Here and there is an easier line. Merryweather's Bend, one quarter less three. Depth of water, one quarter less than three fathoms. Run shape of upper bar and go into the low place in willows about two hundred feet lower down than last year one simple little note out of hundreds far more complicated it would take days for the average mind to remember even a single page of such statistics and those long four-hour gaps where he had been asleep they are still there and somehow after more than fifty years the old heartache is still in them he got a new book maybe for the next trip and laid this one away there is but one way to account for the fact that the man whom the world knew as Mark Twain, dreamy, unpractical, and indifferent to details, ever persisted in acquiring knowledge like that, in the vast, the absolutely limitless quantity necessary to Mississippi piloting. It lies in the fact that he loved the river in its every mood and aspect and detail, and not only the river, but a steamboat and still more, perhaps, the freedom of the pilot's life and its prestige. Wherever he has written of the river, and in one way or another he was always writing of it, we feel the claim of the old captivity and that it still holds him. In the Huckleberry Finn book, during those nights and days with Huck and Nigger Jim on the raft, whether in stormlit blackness, still noontide, or the lifting mists of morning, we can fairly smell the river, as Huck himself would say, and we know that it is because the writer loved it with his heart of hearts and literally drank in its environment and atmosphere during those halcyon pilot days. So in his love lay the secret of his marvelous learning, and it is recorded, not by himself but by his teacher, that he was an apt pupil. Horace Bixby has more than once declared, Sam was always good-natured, 
and he had a natural taste for the river. He had a fine memory, and never forgot anything I told him. Mark Twain himself records a different opinion of his memory, with the size of its appalling task. It can only be presented in his own words. In the pages quoted, he had mastered somewhat of the problem, and had begun to take on airs. His chief was a constant menace at such moments. One day he turned on me suddenly with this settler. What is the shape of Walnut Bend? He might as well have asked me my grandmother's opinion of protoplasm. I reflected respectfully, and then said I didn't know it had any particular shape. My gunpowdery chief went off with a bang, of course, and then went on loading and firing until he was out of adjectives. I waited. By and by, he said, My boy, you've got to know the shape of the river perfectly. It is all there is left to steer by on a very dark night. Everything is blotted out and gone. But, mind you, it hasn't the same shape in the night that it has in the daytime. How on earth am I ever going to learn it, then? How do you follow a hall at home in the dark? Because you know the shape of it. You can't see it. Do you mean to say that I've got to know all the million trifling variations of shape in the banks of this interminable river as well as I know the shape of the front hall at home? On my honor, you've got to know them better than any man ever did know the shapes of the halls in his own house. I wish I was dead. Now, I don't want to discourage you, but, well, pile it on me. I might as well have it now as another time. You see, this has got to be learned. There isn't any getting around it. A clear starlight night throws such heavy shadows that if you didn't know the shape of a shore perfectly, you would claw away from every bunch of timber, because you would take the black shadow of it for a solid cape. And, you see, you would be getting scared to death every fifteen minutes by the watch. You would be fifty yards from shore all the time when you ought to be within fifty feet of it. You can't see a snag in one of those shadows, but you know exactly where it is, and the shape of the river tells you when you are coming to it. Then there's your pitch-dark night. The river is a very different shape on a pitch-dark night from what it is on a starlight night. All shores seem to be straight lines, then, and mighty dim ones, too, and you'd run them for straight lines, only you know better. You boldly drive your boat right into what seems to be a solid straight wall. You know very well that, in reality, there is a curve there, and that wall falls back and makes way for you. Then there's your gray mist. You take a night when there's one of these grisly, drizzly, gray mists, and then there isn't any particular shape to a shore. A gray mist would tangle the head of the oldest man that ever lived. Well, then, 
different kinds of moonlight change the shape of the river in different ways you see oh don't say any more please have i got to learn the shape of the river according to all these five hundred thousand different ways if i try to carry all that cargo in my head it would make me stoop-shouldered no you only learn the shape of the river and you learn it with such absolute certainty that you can always steer by the shape that's in your head and never mind the one that's before your eyes very well i'll try it but after i have learned it can i depend on it will it keep the same form and not go fooling around before mr bixby could answer mr w came in to take the watch and he said bixby you'll have to look out for president's island and all that country clear away up above the old hen and chickens the banks are caving and the shape of the shores changing like everything why you wouldn't know the point about forty you can go up inside the old sycamore snag now so that question was answered here were leagues of shore changing shape my spirits were down in the mud again two things seemed pretty apparent to me one was that in order to be a pilot a man had got to learn more than any one man ought to be allowed to know and the other was that he must learn it all over again in a different way every twenty-four hours i went to work now to learn the shape of the river and of all the eluding and ungraspable objects that ever i tried to get mind or hands on that was the chief i would fasten my eyes upon a sharp wooded point that projected far into the river some miles ahead of me and go to laboriously photographing its shape upon my brain and just as i was beginning to succeed to my satisfaction we would draw up to it and the exasperating thing would begin to melt away and fold back into the bank it was plain that i had got to learn the shape of the river in all the different ways that could be thought of upside down wrong end first inside out fore and aft and thorpe ships and then know what to do on gray nights when it hadn't any shape at all so i set about it in the course of time i began to get the best of this naughty lesson and my self-complacency moved to the front once more mr bixby was all fixed and ready to start it to the rear again he opened on me after this fashion how much water did we have in the middle crossing at hole in the wall trip before last i considered this an outrage i said every trip down and up the leadsmen are singing through that tangled place for three-quarters of an hour on a stretch how do you reckon i can remember such a mess as that my boy you've got to remember it you've 
got to remember the exact spot and the exact marks the boat lay in when we had the shoalest water in every one of the five hundred shoal places between st louis and new orleans and you mustn't get the shoal soundings and marks of one trip mixed up with the shoal soundings and marks of another either for they're not often twice alike you must keep them separate when i came to myself again i said when i get so that i can do that i'll be able to raise the dead and then i won't have to pilot a steamboat to make a living i want to retire from this business i want a slush bucket and a brush i'm only fit for a roustabout i haven't got brains enough to be a pilot and if i had i wouldn't have strength enough to carry them around unless i went on crutches now drop that when i say i'll learn a man the river i mean it and you can depend on it i'll learn him or kill him we have quoted at length from this chapter because it seems of very positive importance here it is one of the most luminous in the book so far as the mastery of the science of piloting is concerned and shows better than could any other combination of words something of what is required of the learner it does not cover the whole problem by any means mark twain himself could not present that and even considering his old-time love of the river and the pilot's trade it is still incredible that a man of his temperament could have persisted as he did against such obstacles end of chapter twenty three the supreme science read by john greenman this is section twenty four of mark twain a biography this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography by albert bigelow payne volume one part one eighteen thirty five to eighteen sixty six chapter twenty four the river curriculum he acquired other kinds of knowledge as the streets of hannibal in those early days and the printing offices of several cities had taught him human nature in various unvarnished aspects so the river furnished an added course to that vigorous education morally its atmosphere could not be said to be an improvement on the others navigation in the west had begun with crafts of the flatboat type their navigators rude hardy men heavy drinkers reckless fighters barbaric in their sports coarse in their wit profane in everything steamboatmen were the natural successors of these pioneers a shade less coarse a thought less profane a veneer less barbaric but these things were mainly above stairs you had but to scratch lightly a mate or a deckhand to find the old keel boatmen's savagery captains were overlords and pilots kings in this estate but they were not angels in life on the mississippi clemens refers to his chief's explosive vocabulary and tells us how he envied the mate's manner of giving an order it was easier to acquire those things than piloting and on the whole quicker one could improve upon them too with imagination and wit and a natural gift for terms that samuel clemens maintained his promise as to drink and cards during those apprentice days is something worth remembering if he did not always restrict his profanity to moments of severe pressure or sift the quality of his wit we may also remember that he was an extreme example of a human being in that formative stage which gathers all as grist later to refine it for the uses and delights of men he acquired a vast knowledge of human character he says in that brief sharp schooling i got personally and 
familiarly acquainted with all the different types of human nature that are to be found in fiction, biography, or history. When I find a well-drawn character in fiction or biography, I generally take a warm personal interest in him for the reason that I have known him before, met him on the river. Undoubtedly the river was a great school for the study of life's broader philosophies and humors, philosophies that avoid vague circumlocution and aim at direct and sure results, humors of the rugged and vigorous sort that in Europe are known as American, and in America are known as Western. Let us be thankful that Mark Twain's school was no less than it was, and no more. The demands of the Missouri River trade took Horace Bixby away from the Mississippi somewhat later, and he consigned his pupil, according to custom, to another pilot. It is not certain now to just which pilot, but probably to Zeb Leavenworth or Beck Jolly of the John J. Rowe. The Rowe was a freight boat, as slow as an island and as comfortable as a farm. In fact, the row was owned and conducted by farmers, and San Clemens thought if John Quarles farm could be set afloat, it would greatly resemble that craft in the matter of good fellowship, hospitality, and speed. It was said of her that upstream she could even beat an island, though downstream she could never quite overtake the current, but was a love of a steamboat nevertheless. The row was not licensed to carry passengers, but she always had a dozen family guests aboard, and there was a big boiler deck for dancing and moonlight frolics, also a piano in the cabin. The young pilot sometimes played on the piano and sang to his music songs relating to the grasshopper on the sweet potato vine, or to an old horse by the name of Methuselah took him down and sold him in Jerusalem a long time ago. There were forty-eight stanzas about this ancient horse, all pretty much alike, but the assembled company was not likely to be critical, and his efforts won him laurels. He had a heavenly time on the John J. Rowe, and then came what seemed inferno by contrast. Bixby returned, made a trip or two, then left and transferred him again, this time to a man named Brown. Brown had a berth on the fine new steamer Pennsylvania, one of the handsomest boats on the river, and young Clemens had become a fine steersman, so it is not unlikely that both men at first were gratified by the arrangement. But Brown was a fault-finding, tyrannical chief, ignorant, vulgar, and malicious. In the Mississippi book, the author gives his first interview with Brown, also his last one. For good reasons these occasions were burned into his memory, and they may be accepted as substantially correct. Brown had an offensive manner. His first greeting was a surly question. Are you Horace Bigsby's cub? Bixby was usually pronounced Bigsby on the river. But Brown made it especially obnoxious and followed it up with questions and comments and orders still more odious. His subordinate soon learned to detest him thoroughly. It was necessary, however, to maintain a respectable deportment. Custom, discipline, even the law required that. But it must have been a hard winter and spring the young steersman put in during those early months of 1858, restraining himself from the gratification of slaying Brown. Time would bring revenge, a tragic revenge, and at a fearful cost. But he could not guess that, and he put in his spare time planning punishments of his own. I could imagine myself killing Brown. There was no law against that. And that was the thing I always used to do the moment I was abed. Instead of going over my river in my mind, as was my duty, I threw business aside for the pleasure, and killed Brown. 
I killed Brown every night for a month, not in old, stale, commonplace ways, but in new and picturesque ones, ways that were sometimes surprising for freshness of design and ghastly for situation and environment. Once, when Brown had been more insulting than usual, his subordinate went to bed and killed him in seventeen different ways, all of them new. He had made an effort at first to please Brown, but it was no use. Brown was the sort of a man that refused to be pleased. No matter how carefully his subordinate steered, he was always at him. Here, he would shout, where are you going now? Pull her down! Pull her down, don't you hear me? That darn mudcat! His assistant lost all desire to be obliging to such a person, and even took occasion now and then to stir him up. One day they were steaming up the river when Brown noticed that the boat seemed to be heading towards some unusual point. Here, where are you heading for now? he yelled. What in the nation are you steering at, anyway, ding numbskull? Why, said Sam, in unruffled deliberation, I didn't see much else I could steer for, and I was heading for that white heifer on the bank. Get away from that wheel, and get out in this pilot house, yelled Brown. You ain't fit to become no pilot. Which was what Sam wanted. Any temporary relief from the carping tyranny of Brown was welcome. He had been on the river nearly a year now, and though universally liked and accounted a fine steersman, he was receiving no wages. There had been small need of money for a while, for he had no board to pay, but clothes wear out at last, and there were certain incidentals. The Pennsylvania made a round trip in about thirty-five days, with a day or two of idle time at either end. The young pilot found that he could get night employment, watching freight on the New Orleans levee and thus earn from two and a half to three dollars for each night's watch. Sometimes there would be two nights, and with a capital of five or six dollars he accounted himself rich. It was a desolate experience, he said long afterward, watching there in the dark among those piles of freight, not a sound, not a living creature astir, but it was not a profitless one. I used to have inspirations as I sat there alone those nights. I used to imagine all sorts of situations and possibilities. Those things got into my books by and by, and furnished me with many a chapter. I can trace the effect of those nights through most of my books in one way and another. Many of the curious tales in the latter half of the Mississippi book came out of those long night watches. It was a good time to think of such things. End of chapter 24 The River Curriculum Read by John Greenman This is section 25 of Mark Twain, A Biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography by Albert Bigelow Payne Volume 1, Part 1, 1835 to 1866 Chapter 25, Love-Making and Adventure Of course, life with Brown was not all sorrow. At either end of the trip there was respite and recreation. In St. Louis, at Pamela's, there was likely to be company. Hannibal friends mostly, schoolmates, girls, of course. At New Orleans he visited friendly boats, especially the John J. Row, where he was generously welcomed. One such visit on the Row he never forgot. A young girl was among the boat's guests that trip, another Laura, fifteen, winning, delightful. They met and were mutually attracted. In the life of each it was one of those bright spots which are likely to come in youth, one of those sudden, brief periods of romance, love, 
call it what you will, the thing that leads to marriage, if pursued. I was not four inches from that girl's elbow during our waking hours for the next three days. Then came a sudden interruption. Zeb Leavenworth came flying aft, shouting, The Pennsylvania is backing out! A flutter of emotion, a fleeting goodbye, a flight across the decks, a flying leap from romance back to reality, and it was all over. He wrote her, but received no reply. He never saw her again, never heard from her for forty-eight years, when both were married, widowed, and old. She had not received his letter. Even on the Pennsylvania life had its interests. A letter dated March 9, 1858, recounts a delightfully dangerous night adventure in the steamer's yawl, hunting for soundings in the running ice. Then the fun commenced. We made fast a line twenty fathoms long to the bow of the yawl, and put the men, both crews, to it, like horses on the shore. Brown, the pilot, stood in the bow with an oar to keep her head out, and I took the tiller. We would start the men, and all would go well till the yawl would bring up on a heavy cake of ice, and then the men would drop like so many ten pins, while Brown assumed the horizontal in the bottom of the boat. After an hour's hard work we got back, with ice half an inch thick on the oars, sent back and warped up the other yawl, and then George, George Earl, the other pilot, and myself took a double crew of fresh men and tried it again. This time we found the channel in less than half an hour, and landed on an island till the Pennsylvania came along and took us off. The next day was colder still. I was out in the yawl twice, and then we got through. But the infernal steamboat came near running us over. We sounded Hat Island, warped up around a bar, and sounded again, but in order to understand our situation, you will have to read Dr. Kane. It would have been impossible to get back to the boat. But the Maria Denning was aground at the head of the island. They hailed us, we ran alongside, and they hoisted us in and thawed us out. We had then been out in the yawl from four o'clock in the morning till half-past nine without being near a fire. There was a thick coating of ice over men and yawl, ropes and everything else, and we looked like rock-candy statuary. This was the sort of thing he loved in those days. We feel the writer's evident joy and pride in it. In the same letter he says, I can't correspond with the paper, because when one is learning the river he is not allowed to do or think about anything else. Then he mentions his brother Henry, and we get the beginning of that tragic episode for which, though blameless, Samuel Clemens always held himself responsible. Henry was doing little or nothing here, St. Louis, and I sent him to our clerk to work his way for a trip, measuring woodpiles, counting coal boxes, and doing other clerkly duties which he performed satisfactorily. He may go down with us again. Henry Clemens was about twenty at this time, a handsome, attractive boy of whom his brother was lavishly fond and proud. He did go on the next trip, and continued to go regularly after that, as third clerk in line of promotion. 
it was a bright spot in those hard days with brown to have henry along the boys spent a good deal of their leisure with the other pilot george ealer who was as kind-hearted as brown wasn't and quoted shakespeare and goldsmith and played the flute to his fascinated and inspiring audience these were things worth while the young steersman could not guess that the shadow of a long sorrow was even then stretching across the path ahead yet in due time he received a warning a remarkable and impressive warning though of a kind seldom heeded one night when the pennsylvania lay in st louis he slept at his sister's house and had this vivid dream he saw henry a corpse lying in a metallic burial case in the sitting-room supported on two chairs on his breast lay a bouquet of flowers white with a single crimson bloom in the center when he awoke it was morning but the dream was so vivid that he believed it real perhaps something of the old hypnotic condition was upon him for he rose and dressed thinking he would go in and look at his dead brother instead he went out on the street in the early morning and had walked to the middle of the block before it suddenly flashed upon him that it was only a dream he bounded back rushed to the sitting-room and felt a great trembling revulsion of joy when he found it really empty he told pamela the dream then put it out of his mind as quickly as he could the pennsylvania sailed from st louis as usual and made a safe trip to new orleans a safe trip but an eventful one on it occurred that last interview with brown already mentioned it is recorded in the mississippi book but cannot be omitted here somewhere down the river it was in eagle bend henry appeared on the hurricane deck to bring an order from the captain for a landing to be made a little lower down brown was somewhat deaf but would never confess it he may not have understood the order at all events he gave no sign of having heard it and went straight ahead he disliked henry as he disliked everybody of a finer grain than himself and in any case was too arrogant to ask for a repetition they were passing the landing when captain kleinfelter appeared on the deck and called to him to let the boat come round adding didn't henry tell you to land here no sir captain kleinfelter turned to sam didn't you hear him yes sir brown said shut your mouth you never heard anything of the kind by and by henry came into the pilot-house unaware of any trouble brown set upon him in his ugliest manner here why didn't you tell me we had to go to land at that plantation he demanded henry was always polite always gentle i did tell you mr brown it's a lie sam clemens could stand brown's abuse of himself but not of henry he said you lie yourself he did tell you brown was dazed for a moment and then he shouted i'll attend to your case in half a minute and ordered henry out of the pilot-house the boy had started when brown suddenly seized him by the collar and struck him in the face in the mississippi book the writer states that brown started to strike henry with a large piece of coal but in a letter written soon after the occurrence to mrs orion clemens he says henry started out of the pilot-house brown jumped up and collared him turned him half way round and struck him in the face and him nearly six feet high struck my little brother i was wild from that moment i left the boat to steer herself and avenged the insult and the captain said i was right instantly sam was upon brown with a heavy stool and stretched him on the floor then all the bitterness and indignation that had been smoldering for months flamed up and leaping upon brown and holding him with his knees he pounded him with his fists until strength and fury gave out brown struggled free then and with pilot instinct sprang to the wheel for the vessel had been drifting and might have got into trouble seeing there was no further danger he seized a spy-glass as a weapon get out of this here pilot-house he raged but his subordinate was not afraid of him now you should 
leave out the here he drawled critically it is understood and not considered good english form don't you give me none of your airs yelled brown i ain't gonna stand nothing more from you you should say don't give me any of your airs sam said sweetly and the last half of your sentence almost defies correction a group of passengers and white aproned servants assembled on the deck forward applauded the victor brown turned to the wheel raging and growling clemens went below where he expected captain kleinfelter to put him in irons perhaps for it was thought to be felony to strike a pilot the officer took him into his private room and closed the door at first he looked at the culprit thoughtfully then he made some inquiries did you strike him first captain kleinfelter asked yes sir what with a stool sir hard middling sir did it knock him down he he, he fell sir did you follow it up did you do anything further yes sir what did you do pounded him sir pounded him yes sir did you pound him much that is severely one might call it that sir yeah, maybe i am deuced glad of it hark ye never mention that i said that you have been guilty of a great crime and don't ever be guilty of it again on this boat but lay for him ashore give him a good sound thrashing do you hear i'll pay the expenses life on the mississippi captain kleinfelter told him to clear out then and the culprit heard him enjoying himself as the door closed behind him brown of course forbade him the pilot-house after that and he made the rest of the trip an emancipated slave listening to george ealer's flute and his readings from goldsmith and shakespeare playing chess with him sometimes and learning a trick which he would use himself in the long after years that of taking back the last move and running out the game differently when he saw defeat brown swore that he would leave the boat at new orleans if sam clemens remained on it and captain kleinfelter told brown to go then when another pilot could not be obtained to fill his place the captain offered to let clemens himself run the daylight watches thus showing his confidence in the knowledge of the young steersman who had been only a little more than a year at the wheel but clemens himself had less confidence and advised the captain to keep brown back to st louis he would follow up the river by another boat and resume his place as steersman when brown was gone without knowing it he may have saved his life by that decision it is doubtful if he remembered his recent disturbing dream though some foreboding would seem to have hung over him the night before the pennsylvania sailed henry liked to join in the night watches on the levee when he had finished his duties and the brothers often walked the round chatting together on this particular night the elder spoke of disaster on the river finally he said in case of accident whatever you do don't lose your head the passengers will do that rush for the hurricane deck and to the lifeboat and obey the mate's orders when the boat is launched help the women and children into it don't get in yourself the river is only a mile wide you can swim ashore easily enough it was good manly advice but it yielded a long harvest of sorrow end of chapter twenty five love making and adventure read by john greenman this is section twenty six of mark twain a biography this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography by albert bigelow payne volume one part one eighteen thirty five to eighteen sixty six 
Chapter Twenty Six: The Tragedy of the Pennsylvania. Captain Kleinfelter obtained his steersman a pass on the A. T. Lacey, which left two days behind the Pennsylvania. This was pleasant, for Bart Bowen had become captain of the fine ship. The Lacey touched at Greenville, Mississippi, and a voice from the landing shouted, "'The Pennsylvania is blown up just below Memphis at Ship Island. One hundred and fifty lives lost.' Nothing further could be learned there, but that evening at Napoleon a Memphis extra reported some of the particulars. Henry Clemens' name was mentioned as one of those who had escaped injury. Still farther up the river they got a later extra. Henry was again mentioned, this time as being scalded beyond recovery. By the time they reached Memphis they knew most of the details. At six o'clock that warm mid-June morning, while loading wood from a large flat boat sixty miles below Memphis, four out of eight of the Pennsylvania's boilers had suddenly exploded with fearful results. All the forward end of the boat had been blown out. Many persons had been killed outright. Many more had been scalded and crippled and would die. It was one of those hopeless wholesale steamboat slaughters which for more than a generation had made the Mississippi a river of death and tears. Samuel Clemens found his brother stretched upon a mattress on the floor of an improvised hospital, a public hall, surrounded by more than thirty others more or less desperately injured. He was told that Henry had inhaled steam, and that his body was badly scalded. His case was considered hopeless. Henry was one of those who had been blown into the river by the explosion. He had started to swim for the shore, only a few hundred yards away, but presently, feeling no pain and believing himself unhurt, he had turned back to assist in the rescue of the others. What he did after that could not be clearly learned. The vessel had taken fire. The rescued were being carried aboard the big wood boat still attached to the wreck. The fire soon raged so that the rescuers and all who could be saved were driven into the wood flat, which was then cut adrift and landed. There the sufferers had to lie in the burning sun many hours until help could come. Henry was among those who were insensible by that time. Perhaps he had really been uninjured at first, and had been scalded in his work of rescue. It will never be known. His brother, hearing these things, was thrown into the deepest agony and remorse. He held himself to blame for everything, for Henry's presence on the boat, for his advice concerning safety of others, for his own absence when he might have been there to help and protect the boy. He wanted to telegraph at once to his mother and sister to come, but the doctors persuaded him to wait, just why he never knew. He sent word of the disaster to Orion, who by this time had sold out in Keokuk and was in East Tennessee studying law. Then he set himself to the all but hopeless task of trying to bring Henry back to life. Many Memphis ladies were acting as nurses, and one, a Miss Wood, attracted by the boy's youth and striking features, joined in the desperate effort. Some medical students had come to assist the doctors, and one of these also took special interest in Henry's case. Dr. Peyton, an old Memphis practitioner, declared that, with such care, the boy might pull through. But on the fourth night he was considered to be dying. Half delirious with grief and the strain of watching, Samuel Clemens wrote to his mother and to his sister-in-law in Tennessee. The letter to Orion Clemens' wife has been preserved. Memphis, Tennessee, Friday, June 18, 1858 Dear Sister Molly, Long before this reaches you, my poor Henry, my darling, my pride, my glory, my all, will have finished his blameless career, and the light of my life will have gone out in utter darkness. The horrors of three days have swept over me. They have blasted my youth and left me an old man before my time. Molly, there are gray hairs in my head tonight. For forty-eight hours 
I labored at the bedside of my poor burned and bruised but uncomplaining brother, and then the star of my hope went out and left me in the gloom of despair. Men take me by the hand and congratulate me and call me lucky because I was not on the Pennsylvania when she blew up. May God forgive them, for they know not what they say. I was on the Pennsylvania five minutes before she left New Orleans, and I must tell you the truth, Molly, three hundred human beings perished by that fearful disaster, but may God bless Memphis, the noblest city on the face of the earth. She has done her duty by these poor afflicted creatures, especially Henry, for he has had five, I ten, fifteen, twenty times the care and attention that anyone else has had. Dr. Peyton, the best physician in Memphis, he is exactly like the portraits of Webster, sat by him for thirty-six hours. There are thirty-two scalded men in that room, and you would know Dr. Peyton better than I can describe him if you could follow him around and hear each man murmur as he passes, May the God of heaven bless you, doctor. The ladies have done well, too. Our second mate, a handsome, noble-hearted young fellow, will die. Yesterday a beautiful girl of fifteen stooped timidly down by his side and handed him a pretty bouquet. The poor suffering boy's eyes kindled, his lips quivered out a gentle, God bless you, miss, and he burst into tears. He made them write her name on a card for him that he might not forget it. Pray for me, Molly, and pray for my poor sinless brother. Your unfortunate brother, Samuel L. Clemens. P.S. I got here two days after Henry. But alas, this was not all, nor the worst. It would seem that Samuel Clemens' cup of remorse must be always overfull. The final draft that would embitter his years was added the sixth night after the accident, the night that Henry died. He could never bring himself to write it. He was never known to speak of it but twice. Henry had rallied soon after the foregoing letter had been mailed, and improved slowly that day and the next. Dr. Peyton came around about eleven o'clock on the sixth night and made careful examination. He said, I believe he is out of danger and will get well. He is likely to be restless during the night. The groans and fretting of the others will disturb him. If he cannot rest without it, tell the physician in charge to give him one-eighth of a grain of morphine. The boy did wake during the night and was disturbed by the complaining of the other sufferers. His brother told the young medical student in charge what the doctor had said about the morphine. But morphine was a new drug then. The student hesitated, saying, I have no way of measuring. I don't know how much an eighth of a grain would be. Henry grew rapidly worse, more and more restless. His brother was half beside himself with the torture of it. He went to the medical student. If you have studied drugs, he said, you ought to be able to judge an eighth of a grain of morphine. The young man's courage was overswayed. He yielded and ladled out in the old-fashioned way, on the point of a knife-blade, what he believed to be the right amount. Henry immediately sank into a heavy sleep. He died before morning. His chance of life had been 
infinitesimal, and his death was not necessarily due to the drug, but Samuel Clemens, unsparing in his self-blame, all his days carried the burden of it. He saw the boy taken to the dead room, then the long strain of grief, the days and nights without sleep, the ghastly realization of the end overcame him. A citizen of Memphis took him away in a kind of daze and gave him a bed in his house, where he fell into a stupor of fatigue and surrender. It was many hours before he woke. When he did, at last he dressed and went to where Henry lay. The coffin provided for the dead were of unpainted wood, but the youth and striking face of Henry Clemens had aroused a special interest. The ladies of Memphis had made up a fund of sixty dollars and bought for him a metallic case. Samuel Clemens, entering, saw his brother lying exactly as he had seen him in his dream, lacking only the bouquet of white flowers with its crimson center, a detail made complete while he stood there, for at that moment an elderly lady came in with a large white bouquet, and in the center of it was a single red rose. Orion arrived from Tennessee, and the brothers took their sorrowful burden to St. Louis, subsequently to Hannibal, his old home. The death of this lovely boy was a heavy sorrow to the community where he was known, for he had been a favorite with all. For a fine characterization of Henry Clemens, the reader is referred to a letter written by Orion Clemens to Miss Wood. See Appendix A at the end of the last volume. From Hannibal, the family returned to Pamela's home in St. Louis. There, one night, Orion heard his brother moaning and grieving and walking the floor of his room. By and by, Sam came in to where Orion was. He could endure it no longer, he said. He must tell somebody. Then he poured all the story of that last tragic night. It has been set down here because it accounts for much in his afterlife. It magnified his natural compassion for the weakness and blunders of humanity, while it increased the poor opinion implanted by the Scotchman Macfarlane of the human being as a divine invention. Two of Mark Twain's chief characteristics were consideration for the human species and contempt for it. In many ways he never overcame the tragedy of Henry's death. He never really looked young again gray hairs had come, as he said, and they did not disappear. His face took on the serious, pathetic look which from that time it always had in repose. At twenty-three he looked thirty. At thirty he looked nearer forty. After that the discrepancy in age and looks became less notable. In vigor, complexion, and temperament, he was regarded in later life as young for his years, but never in looks. End of chapter 26 The Tragedy of the Pennsylvania Read by John Greenman This is section 27 of Mark Twain, A Biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography by Albert Bigelow Payne Volume One, Part One, 1835 to 1866, Chapter Twenty Seven, The Pilot. The young pilot returned to the river as steersman for George Ealer, whom he loved, and in September of that year obtained a full license as Mississippi River pilot. In Life on the Mississippi, he gives his period of learning at from two to two and a half years but documentary evidence, as well as Mr. Bigsby's testimony, places the apprenticeship at eighteen months. Bigsby had returned by this time, and they were again together, first on the Crescent City, later on a fine new boat called the New Falls City. Clemens was still a steersman when Bigsby returned, but as soon as his license was granted, September ninth, 1858, his old chief took him as full partner. He was a pilot at last. In eighteen months he had packed away in his head all the multitude of volatile statistics and acquired that confidence and courage which made him one of the elect, a river sovereign. He knew every snag and bank and dead tree and reef in all those endless miles between St. Louis and New Orleans. 
every cut-off and current, every depth of water, the whole story, by night and by day. He could smell danger in the dark. He could read the surface of the water as an open page. At twenty-three he had acquired a profession which surpassed all others for absolute sovereignty and yielded an income equal to that then earned by the vice-president of the United States. Boys generally finish college at about that age, but it is not likely that any boy ever finished college with the mass of practical information and training that was stored away in Samuel Clemens' head, or with his knowledge of human nature, his preparation for battle with the world. Not only was he a pilot, but a good one. These are Horace Bixby's words, and he added, It is the fashion today to disparage Sam's piloting. Men who were born since he was on the river and never saw him will tell you that Sam was never much of a pilot. Most of them will tell you that he was never a pilot at all. As a matter of fact, Sam was a fine pilot, and in a day when piloting on the Mississippi required a great deal more brains and skill and application than it does now. There were no signal lights along the shore in those days, and no searchlights on the vessels. Everything was blind, and on a dark, misty night, in a river full of snags and shifting sand, bars and changing shores, a pilot's judgment had to be founded on absolute certainty. He had plenty of money now. He could help his mother with a liberal hand, and he did it. He helped Orion, too, with money and with advice. From a letter written toward the end of the year, we gather the new conditions. Orion would seem to have been lamenting over prospects, and the young pilot, strong and exalted in his new estate, urges him to renewed consistent effort. What is a government without energy, he says, and what is a man without energy? Nothing, nothing at all. What is the grandest thing in Paradise Lost? The arch fiend's terrible energy. What was the greatest feature in Napoleon's character? His unconquerable energy. Sum all the gifts that man is endowed with, and we give our greatest share of admiration to his energy. And today, if I were a heathen, I would rear a statue to energy and fall down and worship it. I want a man to, I, I want you to take up a line of action and follow it out in spite of the very devil. Orion and his wife had returned to Keokuk by this time, waiting for something in the way of a business opportunity. His pilot brother wrote him more than once letters of encouragement and counsel. Here and there he refers to the tragedy of Henry's death and the shadow it has cast upon his life. But he was young, he was successful, his spirits were naturally exuberant. In the exhilaration of youth and health and success, he finds vent at times in that natural human outlet, self-approval. He not only exhibits this weakness, but confesses it with characteristic freedom. Putting all things together, I begin to think I am rather lucky than otherwise, a notion which I was slow to take up. The other night I was about to round two for a storm, but concluded that I could find a smoother bank somewhere. I landed five miles below. The storm came, passed away, and did not injure us. Coming up, day before yesterday, I looked at the spot I first chose, and half the trees on the bank were torn to shreds. We couldn't have lived five minutes in such a tornado. And I am also lucky in having a berth, while all the other young pilots are idle. This is the luckiest circumstance that ever befell me, not on account of the wages, for that is a secondary consideration, 
but from the fact that the city of Memphis is the largest boat in the trade, and the hardest to pilot, and, consequently, I can get a reputation on her, which is a thing I never could accomplish on a transient boat. I can bank in the neighborhood of one hundred dollars a month on her, and that will satisfy me for the present, principally because the other youngsters are sucking their fingers. Bless me, what a pleasure there is in revenge, and what vast respect prosperity commands. Why, six months ago I could enter the rooms and receive only the customary fraternal greeting. Now they say, Why, how are you, old fellow? When did you get in? And the young pilots who used to tell me patronizingly that I could never learn the river cannot keep from showing a little of their chagrin at seeing me so far ahead of them. Permit me to blow my horn, for I derive a living pleasure from these things, and I must confess that when I go to pay my dues, I rather like to let the damned rascals get a glimpse of a hundred-dollar bill peeping out from amongst notes of smaller dimensions whose face I do not exhibit. You will despise this egotism, but I tell you there is a stern joy in it. We are dwelling on this period of Mark Twain's life, for it was a period that perhaps more than any other influenced his future years. He became completely saturated with the river. Its terms, its memories, its influence remained a definite factor in his personality to the end of his days. Moreover, it was his first period of great triumph, where before he had been a subaltern, not always even a wage earner, now, all in a moment, he had been transformed into a high chief. The fullest ambition of his childhood had been realized, more than realized, for in that day he had never dreamed of a boat or of an income of such stately proportions. Of great personal popularity, and regarded as a safe pilot, he had been given one of the largest, most difficult of boats. Single-handed and alone, he had fought his way into the company of kings. And we may pardon his vanity. He could hardly fail to feel his glory and revel in it, and wear it as a halo, perhaps, a little now and then, in the association rooms. To this day he is remembered as a figure there, though we may believe, regardless of his own statement, that it was not entirely because of his success. As the boys of Hannibal had gathered round to listen when Sam Clemens began to speak, so we may be certain that the pilots at St. Louis and New Orleans laid aside other things when he had an observation to make or a tale to tell. He was much given to spinning yarns, writes one associate of those days, so funny that his hearers were convulsed, and yet all the time his own face was perfectly sober. If he laughed at all, it must have been inside. It would have killed his hearers to do that. Occasionally some of his droll yarns would get into the papers. He may have written them himself. Another river man of those days has recalled a story he heard Sam Clemens tell. We were speaking of presence of mind in accidents. We were always talking of such things. Then he said, Boys, I had great presence of mind once. It was at a fire. An old man leaned out of a four-story building calling for help. Everybody in the crowd below looked up, but nobody did anything. The ladders weren't long enough. Nobody had any presence of mind. Nobody but me. I came to the rescue. I yelled for a rope. When it came, I threw the old man the end of it. He caught it, and I told him to tie it around his waist. He did so, and I pulled him down. 
This was one of the stories that got into print and traveled far. Perhaps, as the old pilot suggests, he wrote some of them himself. For Horace Bixby remembers that Sam was always scribbling when not at the wheel. But if he published any work in those river days, he did not acknowledge it later, with one exception. The exception was not intended for publication either. It was a burlesque written for the amusement of his immediate friends. He has told the story himself more than once, but it belongs here for the reason that somewhere out of the general circumstance of it there originated a pseudonym one day to become the best known in the hemispheres, the name Mark Twain. That terse, positive, peremptory, dynamic pen name was first used by an old pilot named Isaiah Sellers, a sort of oldest inhabitant of the river, who made the other pilots weary with the scope and antiquity of his reminiscent knowledge. He contributed paragraphs of general information and Nestorian opinions to the New Orleans Picayune, and signed them Mark Twain. They were quaintly egotistical in tone, usually beginning, My opinion for the benefit of the citizens of New Orleans, and reciting incidents and comparisons dating as far back as 1811. Captain Sellers naturally was regarded as fair game by the young pilots, who amused themselves by imitating his manner and general attitude of speech. But Clemens went further. He wrote at considerable length a broadly burlesque imitation signed Sergeant Fathom, with an introduction which referred to the said Fathom as one of the oldest cub pilots on the river. The letter that followed related a perfectly impossible trip supposed to have been made in 1763 by the steamer the old first jubilee with a chinese captain and a choctaw crew it is a gem of its kind and will bear reprint in full today see appendix b at the end of the last volume the burlesque delighted bart bowen who was clemens pilot partner on the edward j gay at the time he insisted on showing it to others and finally upon printing it Clemens was reluctant, but consented. It appeared in the True Delta, May 8th or 9th, 1859, and was widely and boisterously enjoyed. It broke Captain Sellers' literary heart. He never contributed another paragraph. Mark Twain always regretted the whole matter deeply, and his own revival of the name was a sort of tribute to the old man he had thoughtlessly wounded. If Captain Sellers has knowledge of material matters now, he is probably satisfied, for these things brought to him, and to the name he had chosen, what he could never himself have achieved, immortality. End of chapter 27 The Pilot Read by John Greenman